Okay, I think we're ready to get started. I'm sure there'll be a few more people that will be jumping on as we uh, start to get things rolling here this morning. So uh, first of all, good morning, everybody, and welcome. We're very glad to have everybody here. And uh, given how, how challenging things are out there right now and uncertain, we really appreciate you carving out the time to come join us this morning. Uh, this is our second uh, virtual meeting, and we are uh, looking forward to having a good, strong group this morning. Uh, as always, as we do with our regular meetings, as uh, those of you may know who have attended our regular in-person meetings. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing questions and comments from everybody as well. Uh, as of right now, everybody is muted. So we invite you to use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen, and allow you to, uh, to ask a question, raise your hand, and then uh, I will definitely address that with the group. And uh, Michael, our speaker this morning, will also answer your questions too. So it should be a, a good, lively conversation, definitely. Uh, for those of you that I have not met yet, I know we have a, a number of, of new folks on this morning, which is great, new faces. Uh, it's much easier to get here uh, virtually versus uh, driving down to UTC every month. So uh, thank you all. Uh, my name is Ken Schmidt. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of this group, the Sales and Marketing Leadership Alliance, which we uh, founded back in 2011 here in San Diego. And we have an Orange County chapter. Uh, we are revamping our LA chapter as well. And we are looking to uh, launch our Austin chapter. It was going to be the 22nd of this month, but needless to say, things are on hold uh, for about a month or so. So uh, we'll probably get that going sometime in early June is the uh, game plan now. Uh, so we're happy to have you all here. Uh, we are very excited about the conversation this morning also. A couple of other uh, housekeeping things as well for those that just joined us. As I mentioned, please go ahead and use the Q&A function for any questions that you might have and we will take care of getting those uh, answered as well this morning. Uh, secondly, if you have been to one of our in-person meetings before, you know that we usually do uh, what we call our success trios. Uh, we found that uh, obviously with the in-person meetings, it's great to connect with everybody, but it can be tough to really have a deeper dive into each other's uh, backgrounds and kind of how you can help each other. So we chatted about this uh, earlier uh, offline and decided we wanna continue that. Uh, and we're gonna do in quads now instead of in trios. Uh, so you will, by the end of uh, tomorrow, you'll receive an email from Elaine with uh, your designation about uh, which uh, success quad you will be in. Uh, please go ahead and let Elaine know. Elaine's going to include her email address in the uh, chat, uh, chat room this morning. So please go ahead. If you do want to get involved with a success quad, email her directly, uh, and you'll see her email popping up here pretty fast. The, uh, the game plan with the, uh, the quads really is for you to do a deeper dive, learn a little bit more about each other. Uh, you can do a Zoom meeting or you know, go, go to meeting, whatever uh, platform you would like to use. And uh, then you'll be uh, grouped up with a, another, another three people, so four folks total. And you'll be able to uh, connect with one another and find out how you can help each other out and learn more about each other's businesses as well. So that is the uh, purpose and the goal of our success quads, okay? Um, I also want to take just a quick moment as well and uh, welcome probably probably our, our uh, furthest away uh, participant this morning, uh, Neo Ross, who uh, is out in uh, Oslo, uh, Norway. And um, he actually was our member of the year last year, was not able to attend our end of the uh, end of the, of the uh, year party uh, to receive his award. But I do want to acknowledge him and, and thank him. So um, welcome, Neo, and uh, welcome anybody else that also happens to be over in Europe. So it's great. And we look forward to seeing Neo in person uh, later on this year also. All right, great. So those are kind of the, some of the housekeeping things that we have uh, just to kind of chat again. Any questions that you might have if you are joining us a little bit late, uh, any questions that you might have, go ahead and use the Q&A uh, function and we'll get on to those as well. And uh, I'll let you know about um, things that are coming up down the road also. I do want to mention very quickly that uh, we are going to have two other events happening this month also virtually. One is scheduled now for the uh, 30th of April, uh, which will be all around uh, sales training. Uh, it'll be led by actually two folks that are very senior executives within the Dale Carnegie organization. Uh, they run the Southern California franchise uh, and learning about kind of what's happening in the world of sales training out there as well. So they will be hosting that event coming up on the 30th. I'm also in the process right now of confirming a date, but it'll probably be the 22nd or 23rd, just be on the lookout for, for that. Um, we are very fortunate that one of my colleagues who also runs an executive search firm, uh, he's actually based out in Shenzhen, China. His name is Michael Wang. 
And so we are going to do a fireside chat with him coming up at the end of the month, uh, talking about really kind of what we here in the U.S. can expect, given that China is several weeks ahead of us, what he's seeing out there in terms of hiring, in terms of companies and sales, uh, marketing, branding, all the usual uh, uh, points of conversation, but with a very unique perspective uh, from China directly. So that'll, that'll be a live interview happening uh, around the 22nd or 23rd. But uh, you know, check out your emails. We'll be sending out the information in the next couple of days once I confirm that with him. So that should be a lot of fun also. All right, great. So let's go ahead and jump into our presentation this morning. Uh, as you all or most of you know, I also run Turning Point Executive Search. So a lot of our conversation is typically around obviously sales, marketing, and kind of what's happening out there in terms of marketing and sales hiring, but also leadership development, training, uh, and we'll talk a lot about that this morning with our guest speaker, uh, Michael Dallas. So uh, I'm going to let Michael go ahead and introduce himself, and uh, we'll get things going. Michael. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> and good morning. Welcome. Wish we were doing this in person. I don't mean I wish I was there with you in your living room or your office, but I wish we were doing this in person and doing this live, but hopefully that will come down the road. Uh, as Ken said, uh, my name is Michael Dallas. My company is called Drive sales consulting. I'll talk my, more about my background in just a minute. The, just want to set the stage for what we're going to talk about today because I'm grateful that you're, you've decided to carve out an hour or so of, of your morning to talk about the topic of team selling. Uh, team selling used to be uh, only done by very large organizations, um, but that's changed. Um, and so it's, it's changed for different reasons, which, which I'm about to talk about. And also in this current environment, um, there are some nuances that we should be aware of. So I want to start by just setting the table and then Ken and I will, will get into some uh, Q&A. Um, so why is team selling more prevailing and, 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 and is it? So for those of you who have read a book called The Challenger Sale, which now goes back probably five, six, seven years, um, you know, there was some research that the authors did that I thought was, it, it was attention getting. Um, this represents the number of decision makers um, involved in a B2B purchase decision. And you can see that I've included on the slide both 2015 and 2017. And when they originally published the research, a lot of people were startled by the fact that there were five and a half people involved in a B2B purchase decision. This is across industries across the globe. Um, what was even more surprising is when they published an update of that in the Harvard Business Review in 2017 at a jump, and this is an average from 5.4 to 6.8. Regardless of whether your sales efforts are on the small business, middle market, or large organizations, what you have probably noticed in the last several years is that there are more people involved. And with more people comes more complexity. And what I've drawn up there is just um, a, a diagram to, to help you when you think, stop and think about just what the difference is between a one-on-one -on -one meeting and a three-on-three -three meeting. There are relationships that we have both with each other and with each of the stakeholders in the decision process. Um, and the more people that are involved, the more complex it gets. And in general, even before this crisis that we're in right now, why was this happening? Well, if you're doing your job as a sales professional, you're identifying broader client needs and there's revenue pressure and you're no doubt feeling that right now or will be feeling it very shortly. And you've got distributed resources. Some of them are available in your, your local market, some of them aren't. From the buying organization side, um, especially coming out of the financial crisis, it's too risky to have one person make a decision. So you may have one person tell you they're the air quotes, decision maker. But the reality is every organization, whether they've got three decision makers or 10 decision makers or 6.8, there are more players, there's a process. And <clears throat> not everybody say in that process is equal. So part of what we're trying to do from uh, a sales standpoint is help them make that decision, factoring in that there are new players, there are more of them, they're networked in ways that we can't see and they're under incredible margin pressure, and now even more than before. And just a word on the current environment and how this is impacting it. Um, so we're all affected by both sides. So if you look at the 
um, three sellers and the three buyers right in front of you, everybody on the screen is impacted by two things. <clears throat> we're working remotely and we're either concerned about or have already experienced headcount reduction um, in the current environment, unless you're in specific industries. Um, on the selling side, if we can't see each other and we can't be together and we can't meet, um, it affects our ability to make decisions. That's make any decisions at all and make the right ones. And on the seller side, if we're gonna work together effectively in a sales effort, um, we've got our own concerns, we're remote, um, and there's a question about is everybody engaged and does everybody have the skill to do it? Um, and so those are some of the additional layers brought on by um, the current environment. So I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, before we even got going on why team selling is a thing. Um, and when we stop and think about it, why it's more complex. Um, Ken and I, as we get into the Q&A, we'll talk about how do you simplify it, how do you solve for it, but I at least want to st start there. Um, I'm going to just flash up on my screen my background just for you to look at. Um, I'm not planning on uh, going into this. I'll say my consulting practice is just built around two areas, helping CEOs, business owners, managing partners solve one of two problems. Either one, there's a growth problem, they're not growing as fast as they want to, or number two, they're not, there's a hiring problem. They're not hiring salespeople or sales managers who are ramping and performing the way they expected them to. So that's enough about me and enough talking. I'm gonna leave that up there just for a minute. And um, Ken, I'm gonna turn it back to you and I'm gonna take off my screen share just so we can begin our fireside chat with my lovely fire. With your me. actual fireside. Yes. I'm jealous, that's very nice. <laughs> So a, a quick uh, follow on to your uh, comments earlier, and thanks for kind of setting the stage for us as well. But in, in the research that you did for your book and with your clients as well, do you find that the decision makers, or I guess the, the companies themselves, are they happy? Are they pleased with the fact that there's more uh, kind of, kind of uh, cooks in the kitchen, if you will, uh, to make a decision? Or does it seem more cumbersome uh, from their perspective? Well, I think it's your question is probably even more complex than you intended it to be. Um, so I'll just take it from the standpoint of when you say the companies, I'll assume let's let's assume it's the C. Yeah, are, sure, are, sure. Are, are they happy about that? You know what? I, I think in my experience, I don't think they're really aware of it. They're not really thinking about it. It's just something that happens in the field. Um, and when people team up for a sale, a lot of times it's not it's not intentional. It's not mindful. The reason they do it, it's more reactive and haphazard um, because the sales professional realizes, hey, I can't, there's something, there's some gap I've got um, and, and I need somebody to fill that gap. And so they quickly grab somebody and show up to a virtual call or uh, a meeting and, you know, with different levels of success. Interesting. And do you think this is, I mean, I know you and I have talked uh, several times over the last couple of years, and I know your, your book is, was written a, a couple of years ago as well. I, did you, before the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis that we're in now, did you see this accelerating? I mean, the, the numbers that you show are from 2017. If you were to do the survey, let's say now, would you think it'd be even more than uh, five and a half average decision makers per sale? I... <sighs> It's an interesting question, Ken. I, I, I don't know that I've seen necessarily more people, let's just say in the last, pardon me, last few years. Um, mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. I have seen is that the, if you take the 6.8 decision makers, uh, the people who actually fill those roles are different. Mm -hmm. Like I'd say, for example, in the last uh, probably five years, you know, we used to think of a procurement or a purchasing officer only being the domain of very large companies. Mm -hmm. um, but we see procurement officers, procurement consultants now in the middle market pretty regularly. So that's one of the 6.8. Um, another factor um, from small middle market, even to the upper middle, mar middle market, is private equity. I mean, think about that. Three or four years ago, private equity wasn't as big a factor in our market as it is today. Um, and as with other outside investors, other board members, we don't necessarily, in pursuing a sale, we don't necessarily have access to them 
But when it comes to a big decision, are they going to weigh in? Yeah. So I don't know that the number has changed, but definitely the roles have changed. Um, with 6.8. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I know even just in our experience on the on the uh, recruiting side as well, you know, we have uh, clients like Kia Motors up in Orange County, a pretty sizable client, uh, and the number of folks that are involved in hiring, you know, mid-level folks, uh, you know, as director and senior director uh, uh, roles, you know, it's, it's quite a bit, and they're obviously a pretty sizable organization uh, based obviously in Asia, but um, so even in that example, it's, it's, it's definitely holds true. But I also, to your, your comment about private equity, as a great example also. We're doing a CEO search right now for another company up in Orange County owned by private equity. And private equity are the ones that brought us in to do the search. And it's a small $10 million organization. Uh, but even in that situation, you know, our final candidates are going to have to meet, as you might expect, the private equity partners uh, and the analysts as well as involved with this organization plus the outgoing CEO and the CFO and probably the head of sales. So yeah, it definitely adds some complexity to making even that you know, kind of a hiring decision, uh, not even buying, but actually a hiring decision. Right, and you think about the diagram that I had up with all the arrows pointing everywhere. Um, there are relationships on those, uh, behind those three people or the 6.8 decision makers that it's difficult for us to understand. So it's easy for us as an outsider to assume that Oh, private equity management, they were all just seamless integration and they're all aligned. Uh, but we know that's, that's often not the case. And so it's important from a sales standpoint, whether it's one of us, two of us, three of us or more, that's something we have to accomplish in our discoveries. We have to figure out how they make decisions and what role, for example, private equity plays in that process. Definitely, yeah, that's a very good point. And just a, a quick aside, I do want to um, remind everybody, if you join late, if you have any questions at all for Michael, please, please feel free to uh, chime in. You can use the Q&A uh, function very easily. It'll help you raise your hand and uh, let us know your question, and then we will address that and answer it for you also. So just a, a quick aside. Um, so to that point uh, that you mentioned a moment ago also, Michael, do you, do you feel like um, as, as the number of people involved has increased over the years, what about in terms of the time to make a decision? I would imagine that's changed a fair amount also uh, in your experience. Well, yeah, so I, I don't have any research that backs up um, the timing of the decision, but, but like you, you know, the assumption that it's logical that with more people involved, um, the decisions are gonna get drawn out. Um, I think one of the big changes that I've seen, especially in the last five to 10 years, is that, um, where we come in as sales professionals to the client's buying process is much later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for those of us who've been selling for 20 years, 30 years or more, you know, we remember a time that, you know, we get in, we work with one decision maker, they can make that decision, a deal is done. Mm -hmm. um, but now you just think about it, let's just take the impact of the internet um, and how much information your organization puts out on the internet. What does that mean for a buyer? Well, so a client who's going through a big B2B purchase decision, they can do a lot of self-sourcing of information without us. So if what we're used to is just showing up, providing information, sending, sending information, um, clients can do most of that themselves. And so we tend to come in much later into their buying process. So that's, that's one difference uh, that I see. Um, and a lot of salespeople still haven't adapted to that. Mm -hmm. um, and number two, a lot of decisions end up with no decision. And so there's a lot of activity and we take time away from perhaps better opportunities to focus, let's say on this one. And it just, it dies. Um, and that's part of what we have to do in the discovery process is better qualify because a lot of people are doing searches for all sorts of different reasons, but we have to understand whether they're really interested in moving it's, and it's an urgent and compelling need to move or just a nice to have. With, with that being said, in terms of uh, you know, it, the, the buyer, if you will, the client, the buyer, having so much information at their disposal so easily and so quickly, has that also affected the role that the team plays when they go out to actually meet the client? In other words, is it, is it less of a technical conversation and more of a rapport building and consultative dialogue? 
Well, so so that's also a really interesting question um, because one of the things you're also pointing to, Ken, is that not only can clients self-source information, but we as the selling team can self-source information before that meeting. And so think about how that changes the dynamic. Um, they're expecting that our team, A, has done the research and B, has shared it among, amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so think about the impact if, if neither one of those things are true. We show up, one of the person on the team says something like, so tell us about your business. <laughs> right. Which, you know, it's, it's a good, curious question, but let's be honest here, in 2020, that's about the worst question. Exactly right. Because it just, it just transmits that we've done nothing. No, no, no preparation at all. Yeah, or somebody's done preparation, but not that person who just asked mm -hmm. the question. Right, exactly. Or they're, or they're so uncertain about what to say, they want to just kind of open with something. It's kind of an open-ended, very generic question. It's the same, I kind of equate that on the recruiting side to a client saying, so tell me about yourself. It's just, yes. <laughs> it's just, yeah. There's nothing wrong with the question. It just, it's, it's, it's just, it's misplaced and it's, it sends an awful signal. It does, yeah. I'd say on that, on that point of information sharing, it is, um, it is something that I know that a lot of sales professionals struggle with. Mm -hmm. So let, let's say Elaine is leading the sale and she's decided, Ken, that, that she really needs your expertise um, in this meeting for her to advance and close the sale. Um, if you and Elaine don't prepare together and don't prepare effectively together, there is one of those moments that's going to happen where you're not going to accomplish what Elaine needed you to mm -hmm. in that meeting. Um, and so there is a fair question for us to talk about in our fireside chat here today, which is what information should Elaine know and what information should she share? Mm -hmm. At least the, the headline on that is she doesn't need to bring you up to speed on everything that she knows about the client, but nothing is also not going to work. Yeah, right, right. We've got, she's got to share enough information for you to perform the role that, that you've been asked to perform for this meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the questions we have from uh, from from Joe today uh, was, you know, is is there a particular uh, department or individual that you see as typically having the final decision or the the uh, most significant kind of decision making power in the conversation? Uh, and if not, how do we, how and should we kind of identify who that person is uh, in the meeting? Yeah. So Joe, thanks thanks for your question. I'm assuming that you're meeting on the buying side. Um, because if we've got 6.8 decision makers, and let's say we're going after a large sale, an enterprise-wide sale that crosses the boundaries of different divisions, um, it becomes really difficult to figure out how that decision is going to be made. Um, I'll tell you where it doesn't get made, which is procurement. Um, a lot of times we get delegated to a procurement officer, and there's nothing wrong. Procurement officers play a very important role in the decision process, but they're not the final decision maker. They're just a gatekeeper to the decision. Um, what we need to accomplish, and most salespeople have difficulty with this, is getting access to all the decision makers so we got a real complete picture. So what happens with most of us is we've got one warm port, one receptive door of entry, um, and so we build chemistry with that person and we uncover needs and we, we take those breadcrumbs that they're lying down for us and we try to solve it best we can. But because it's difficult to get to the C-suite and difficult to get to other division heads, or we're worried about how our, um, our current contact is gonna react to us contacting other people, what happens is we have an incomplete set of information and we're coming to the table, we're pursuing a sale from one person's viewpoint as opposed to everybody's. So that's the risk. And so Joe, just to be responsive to your question, there's no, there's no one answer that I've seen. Um, and I'll tell you another thing that I've seen is it's often not the senior most person. Mm -hmm. We often make the assumption that decisions, if I can draw a little org chart, um, that the person at the top of the org chart is the one who is the economic decision maker who's going to pull the strings, uh, make the pull the lever on the final decision. Um, that's not often the case. Uh, in my experience, it's 
there's somebody in that decision structure who wants change, who needs change. It's not always a senior person, but part of what we need to accomplish in our discovery is figure out who that person is and how that person is going to line everybody up with her to get that decision. So Joe, I hope, I hope that's answering your questions. Probably, you're probably hoping that I said, you know, a certain title, sorry. What about to the point of, you know, I, I find, at least in my, my work on the recruiting side, there are often times where I, my, my first point of contact is the head of HR or head of talent acquisition. And that person may be out there kind of doing a bit of a fact finding mission on behalf of the CEO or the owners or what have you. Uh, and so they are certainly very involved in the conversation uh, and I offer and I encourage people, you know, the, the HR folks to say, great, let's, let's jump on a call as a next step with the hiring manager to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I would say probably eight times out of 10, that HR executive will say, no, that's good. I'm going to go ahead and, and share this information with my hiring manager, let him or her know where things are. Uh, and I know there's a lot that could be lost in translation, unfortunately, right? Is there, is there a way that you have, have seen or found that you recommend that allows us as the sellers, if you will, to make sure that we get an audience with all the decision makers and not just one person who's trying to, you know, kind of maintain control over everything. Yeah. So, so I think the easiest way to, to really approach this is first, the reason that I wanted to start with that slide on the 6.8 decision makers is to make sure for some people, they learn this at the end of the process. Um, it's important for all of us, if you're calling on a mid-sized company or larger, to just make the assumption that there are going to be multiple people involved. And so for you to be successful, for you to have the highest odds of success, you need to get access to as many of those 6.8 people as possible. So that's part of it. It's just that mindset that it's a big decision process. There are going to be multiple people and we don't, we've got to learn how that decision gets made. The second question really comes down to, I think, technique, which is um, if I'm the salesperson and Ken is the HR business partner, but I know the HR business partner isn't gonna make the decision, your question, Ken, is how do I persuade you to, um, to open up the gates and introduce me to some of these other people? And so there are a couple of, couple of points to that. So one point is, um, I need to use my persuasion skills. I need to, need to use my selling skills. And you know, without going into depth on this, just given the limits of our time limits on our call, you know, I got to give you a benefit. Why is it? Why does it serve your interest to introduce me to somebody else? How is it going to benefit them to take a meeting with me? So that's part of it. I'd say the second part of it is if you're being an obstacle and you're not giving me information. Um, and I feel limited in my ability to even sell in extreme cases. And I'd say this is not usually the case. What's the downside to going around Ken? Um, Ken is not my friend. We're not friends. Um, Ken is not helping me help them. Um, so we don't really have a productive business relationship. And I think a lot of people are also uncomfortable with that idea. And I also wanna be clear at the point, I'm not saying be aggressive, be pushy, be that person. But what I am saying is if that line of business leader who's asked Ken to gather information, if they've got a real problem and we don't know if they do, but if they have a real problem that has to get solved and Ken isn't facilitating that, I need to try to find out what that problem is um, so that they can have that problem solved and hopefully so I can attach myself to that. Ken, am I answering that question for you? That's great. Yeah. yeah, I know it's, it's, it certainly is, it's, it could be probably a whole nother book in terms of the, the ways that you go about that. It's, it's not easy. I know one of the things that, that I tend to do is I, and having done this for a while, I, I ask questions that I know, A, the HR person who's, who's reaching out to me may not know, right? Um, and B, I'll also say, you know, I tell them I have found in, in these kind of situations where if we are on a call together, uh, I'm able to glean information and you as the HR executive are also able to glean more information than the, than the hiring manager may have already given you. So to your point, make sure it's, you're, you're, you're kind of showcasing the benefit to that first point of contact uh, as to how it's going to help them if more people are, are on the call together as a next step. And that doesn't always work, but more times than not, it does work. Right. And, and you think about it, why, and that might feel uncomfortable for me to try to push Ken a little bit. 
to bring others involved, uh, get others involved. But why is that important for me as the salesperson? Well, when we get to one of those pivotal meetings where the decision is going to be made, um, how do I know who to bring if I only have Ken's viewpoint? And Ken's viewpoint is one divided by 6.8, and he's not even a real decision maker. He's just gathering information. You know, it, my odds of bringing the right people are so small. I mean, I'm not saying you can never win, uh, but the odds are not on our side because we have such limited information. Sure, sure. And so are there a couple other questions that are coming in? These are, these are actually very, very similar questions. But um, what, so, so what's the best way to introduce your team in to that, that, that uh, conversation, if, if you will? And again, making the, the buyer feel comfortable that, you know, I'm going to be bringing myself and two of my partners out to the meeting, if you will. Um, what's the best way to introduce them? And at what stage do you, do you talk about how it's going to be a, a team sell, if you will? Yeah. So, so really interesting question with actually a lot of different layers on it. So um, in, in the book, um, I, I talk about selling squads versus accounts. And so account teams are, there might be five or 10 of us, depending on how big the sale is, how big your organization is, who might get involved in the planning and development of this relationship with, with this account. But a selling squad is much more tactical. It just means in Elaine's pursuit of an opportunity over time, um, she's gonna be asking different people to join her and then bounce back out um, in order for her to advance, cultivate that opportunity. Um, so selling squads can change. So early when we're in discovery, it might just be Elaine and one other person, maybe because Ken's got great question and listening skills. So she decides to bring Ken. Um, and they do discovery and they find out more and they get access to those 6.8 decision makers. And then as it goes on, we have one of those meetings where it's gonna be a big pitch. Well, Elaine might decide, no offense to Ken, but Ken might not be the guy um, who is gonna play a major role or maybe even any role in, in, that, in that big pitch when we have to put our ideas and our recommendations on the table. But going back to your question, which is okay, whether we're in early stage and there are two of us, or it's late stage, and there are five of us, how do you manage introductions? Which is an interesting question. Most people don't spend any time on this in their prep. Hmm. Think about it, why, why would we? Right, sure. Ken's a pro, he knows his background, uh, he can introduce himself, Elaine's a pro, she knows how to do that. But I'll tell you from, from experience, I'll just give you a, a, a little story here. Um, uh, in my old life, uh, I worked in the institutional asset management business. So we we're pursuing large deals, billions of dollars in assets that we we're going to manage. And the contracts were worth often seven figures, even eight figures. Um, and so we would have in these big, what we would call finals pitches, three, four, five people. So early in my career, if I brought three portfolio managers who are all PhD propeller heads, brilliant. And I just assume they can introduce themselves. Well, you know, you bring three people, all of whom have great things to say about themselves. Let's just say each one takes two or three minutes to talk about their research interests, their advanced degrees, their experience. You know, I bring three people, I'm already 10, 15 minutes into the meeting and all we're doing is talking about ourselves. So that's a common mistake, is just letting people introduce themselves the way they want. Um, what I recommend is that we practice that. Um, and it's gonna feel a little weird the first time for me to say, okay, Elaine, I just shared with you a little bit about XYZ company. We've got this big pivotal meeting. Um, you've got 30 seconds to introduce yourself. What would you say? And Ken, how about you? And I want to give them an opportunity to try it. I want to give them feedback. And then also important, we need to figure out what order we're going to go in. I mean, it seems so basic, this choreography, but if we don't solve for it, I mean, I'll, I see it all the time. And when I bring this up in, you know, when I'm teaching something like how to, how to win a competitive sales pitch and I've got a group, I mean, stories just come out. And everybody's got a story about how introductions, it's the very start of the meeting, seems so basic, it just goes south 
right in the first couple of minutes of the meeting. Um, so the key thing there is give people boundaries, uh, allow them time to practice, give them feedback, don't do it that day, um, give them a day or two in advance so they can make that adjustment and feel confident doing it. So Ken, that's probably a longer answer to your question, but it was actually, it had more layers than, than you probably thought. No, that's great. That's, that's good to go into kind of those examples as well as as uh, far as things that we see out there also. Um, so question for you and kind of just bringing into today's day and age, literally with the coronavirus and the fact that we're all working from home and, you know, pra practicing these these uh, team selling approaches is difficult enough when you're in person. How do you recommend that we handle this and prepare for this when we know over the next at least 45 days or so um, these team selling opportunities are going to all be virtual? which means that you're, you're you know, missing out on the chance to actually read live cues and face-to-face -face cues as well. What thoughts do you have there? So I, I have just put up on the screen for a minute just, uh, it's something that's it's in the book. It's pretty straightforward. Over time I've developed this is just, it's the process for uh, how do you solve for the complexity of team buying decisions and team selling decisions. And, and I've got the five steps up there, but the, the ones on the left side of your screen in gray are what we ought to do, what you do when you're at your best, is you, you put some thought into creating the right team, organizing the collective work together, practicing. The purple is we've got to execute while we're together, how we're going to execute effectively as a team. And then we have to have an after action review so we can learn and get better afterwards. And that's the process. Going back to your point, Ken, which is, okay, in virtual, in virtual environment, how does this affect us? So our practice is gonna happen virtually. Mm -hmm. Our meeting, the execute part of the process is also gonna happen virtually. So what does that mean? And, and you know, it's not, it's not that unusual, even before this environment that we're in, mm -hmm. there's often in a team buying decision there's often at least one person who's calling into the meeting. Mm -hmm. So it sure. may not be face to face and maybe it's audio, maybe it's video and there's technology involved in that. And you may have one or more subject matter experts who's also calling in. Um, and so when we're in practice, that's one of the things that's important to practice is the technology, you know, and, and for, for everybody's benefit, you know, this seems like a pretty straightforward thing, what we're doing today, conducting this talk in Zoom. But Ken and Elaine and I have gotten together, I think three times in advance um, to go through the content, to talk about the flow, to talk to test the technology. And going back on your point on the virtual, um, if there's more on the line, not that there's, a, <laughs> this is not high stakes, Ken. This is very important that we're covering today. But if there's a lot of revenue on the line, and this is a pivotal meeting, we got to solve for that. Mm -hmm. So we got to get comfortable with the virtual. Um, and I'll just give you one variation on that. So if Ken, Elaine and I are colleagues and we're having a virtual meeting, we've got to sort out in our practice session. All right. So if Ken goes off the rails and I need to try to get his attention, how am I going to do it? Am I going to do it through the chat function, through private message? Am I going to send him a text? Am I going to hold up my hand? Whatever it is, we got to sort that out. So because we're not in person, we still have to stay aligned if we're going to be successful. Right. So Which is also important, even in, in person also, it actually might be a little bit easier um, to that with that regard when it comes to, you know, being able to use the private chat that the speaker or the, the, the buyers can't see when you're in person, you know, it's tough to find those, those cues that are, that are not obvious what you're trying to do. So it's, that, again, it comes back to the importance of preparing, getting ready beforehand, uh, especially again with the higher, higher dollar value meetings or higher dollar value potential at stake. Um, practice is just so, so important. Agreed. Yeah. You know, there's some, um, there, oh, look at that, Elaine, nice cat. <laughs> um, there's, you know, when I'm, when I'm doing, um, when I'm giving formal speeches or, or talks on, uh, on this topic, um, I'll often uh, talk about the Blue Angels, which we've all seen. And Blue Angels are, you know, to become a Blue Angel, um, uh, part of that fighter squad, um, you've got to be at the top of your game as a naval or marine aviator. 
Um, I think what a lot of people, what I learned, so I won't say a lot of people don't know, what I don't think I realized is that those, those aircraft weigh 200 tons. Uh, they fly at speeds of up to 300 miles per hour. Um, and the, the separation wingtip wing tip to wingtip can be as close as 36 inches. Hmm. And what's interesting is that as good as they are as individual fighter pilots, um, before they ever have their first session, the first um, demonstration in front of a live audience, um, they run over 100 missions together um, to practice. So, I mean, I'm not saying that we have to practice like that, but you can see that if they just went up and tried to do what they do, you know, there, <laughs> there'd be real damage and real consequences there. Right, exactly. Another question that came through before also from, uh, from Joe was talking about, you know, or actually from Neil, excuse me, how do we, how do we get things back on track, right? And not, not so much during the meeting, but let's say you do have a meeting, it goes well, you have a sense for who the, the decision makers are, but there's still one person that's kind of controlling that conversation. That person goes dark, right? We've all experienced this with all of a sudden, you, you think it's a great conversation, you think it's going, you know, moving towards the finish line, and all of a sudden, you know, darkness and crickets, nothing else, and they're not getting back to you. How do you decide whether or not you stick with that main point of contact that was the, the initial point of contact, or do you now go around that person to, the, to that, who you think is the actual decision maker uh, to try to get things moving again? How do you, how do, you do that? So this is Neo, who was your top member? Yes, exactly. Okay, good. See, this is why Neo's the top member. Right. Um, Neo, I really, really like that question, and, and it's, it's a complex answer. Um, when, when I'm coaching a team um, that's pursuing a very large opportunity, uh, one of the things we do is something called relationship mapping. And so... If this is something that's not familiar to you, let me just spend a minute talking about what relationship mapping is, and that'll be a way to answer Neil's question. Um, relationship mapping is about whiteboarding how the company is going to make the decision, how the organization is going to make the decision. So it looks like an org chart. So think about one person at the top, some branches that come off, and branches that come off there. But instead of just being the org chart, what we're going to try to fill those circles or boxes with are based on our discovery, how is the decision going to be made? So at top is that person who's going to make the final call. Underneath her are going to be the people who are her gatekeepers, her influencers, her main lieutenants, and below those lieutenants are going to be their gatekeepers, who might also be influencers. Mm -hmm. And so when the opportunity is big enough and the sales cycle is long enough, we're whiteboarding this, it's a dynamic document, and we're trying to figure out where our green paths are, where are we strongest, and where are our red paths? Where are we gonna get blocked? And so Neo's point is a perfect one, which is um, we had access, but we lost it. Um, we wanna find out why, but at some point, the goal is not to turn that red path, that person who's against us for some reason, that the goal is not to turn them into a green path because that just takes too much time and too much energy and our odds of success low. Our odds is to come up with another strategy. You know, you're not gonna have all green paths. People have their own agendas, those 6.8. And so we gotta figure out where our best path of success is. Um, but Neo, that's the way I would answer that question is think broadly about how those 6.8 will work together. Think about why that person who you weren't sure whether they were green or red, why they turned red, and now what do you do about that? Do, do you have any um, a, a kind of recent example, if you will, Michael, where you've been talking to a client that uh, used this, if you will, and kind of what happened beforehand where maybe they were stuck and then when they, when they in previous sales, and when they started to use more of the team selling process and approach, things did loosen up and they were able to get to the right people and it wound up being successful. Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. Um, so I'll, I'll bring one that uh, from a couple of months ago, uh, I was working with a large consulting firm. They were pursuing an opportunity, very large opportunity uh, with a major multinational company. Um, there were 12 people involved in the decision process. Um, they had what they consider to be their main contact. 
Um, and we got a lot of information from that main contact at, at this client organization. Um, but there was one person who was like just the bane of their existence. Uh, <laughs> tough persona. Um, if he took meetings, uh, they were never positive. Um, and I, I let the conversation go for a while. You know, them talking about, hey, how can we flip this guy? How can we make him, you know, an advocate for us? And, and then I just asked them, what, how much time have you put into this already? <laughs> and I mean, the stories just kept coming about how many meetings they've had, how hard they've tried. You know, that's just, I think where the source of that is a really positive thing. It's just this team as good people wanting to be liked by everybody. Sure. Right. But at some point they had to just be realistic and say, you know what, we're not going to flip this guy. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about the even the tone in the room is they're just like really down on their their um, optimism about their their chances, and then as soon as we started drawing and coloring all the circles on the chart, they realized they actually had a lot of green relationships that went around the red, and then they started getting excited because then it, it became possible that they could win this opportunity. The other thing that I, I mentioned to them, or, or they just realized, is that somebody is red, not necessarily because they don't like you. They have other interests. Sometimes it's just that they want somebody else to win, for whatever the reasons are. It doesn't mean that they won't be in your court next time. Um, so having a strategy allowed this team to have a, a, a new course of action that they were excited about. Um, so it was continuing. It looked good. But now we're in the silent period, so we don't really know what's going on with that. Country. Right, exactly. Right, <laughs> the dreaded silent period that we all we all have experienced. Well, especially now, uh, yeah. it's silent for all sorts of reasons that we don't know, especially while we're all in lockdown. Yeah, very true. Very true. What about in terms of uh, this? May go back to what you talk talk about in the book, also about making sure that everybody on the team knows their role going into that team meeting. But what about in terms of knowing your role, but also feeling comfortable so that the, the responsibility, if you will, is share. This is a, a question that came up from Joe also, but um, you know, so that everybody, so no one person feels like they have to carry the entire load of the meeting where it's a more shared conversation. Any thoughts there? Yeah, so there are two, two points. I'd say one is in terms of role. Um, it, it's every winning team has a leader. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that person dominates the conversation, but when things happen, which they will, that are unexpected, all eyes go to that person mm -hmm. and that person's got to make the call and got to make the judgment. Um, some other research on um, how much of a role should everybody play. First of all, I, I give a limit when we're talking about who should go to an important meeting. That person should spend, have at least 10 minutes of talking time in that meeting, mm -hmm. whether it's responding to questions or making a point. Because if it's less than that, um, you know, we're just going to bring the clown car and we're going to have like 15 people at the meeting. And I've been in meetings where, believe it or not, 11 people, that's the biggest one that I've been in. 11 wow. people were brought to the meeting just in case. Um, but the best conversations we have being more responsive to Joe's question is when we have equal talk time. And there's some research on this, uh, an author named Sandy Pentland. Uh, he's a professor at MIT. His, his area of research is called social physics, but he measures it on both internal teams and external teams. The best outcomes, the most effective teams are the ones where there's equal talk time. And you can even measure that. It doesn't even matter what you're talking about. It's just how much time each member um, takes. So if I'm leading a sales meeting um, and I have both Ken and Elaine in the meeting, I want them to talk roughly the same amount that I am. And let's imagine we're communicating with three other decision makers. I'm also mindful of that topic of equal talk time because I want to make sure that I'm trying to bring them all in um, for the same amount. Very good. So what, one of the things I think about, and I, I really hadn't thought much about, you know, team selling in, in a more, um, you know, codified way until I read your book and you and I met. Um, and we, as uh, on the recruiting side, I, I usually go in myself, plus I bring one of our recruiters with me, either Danielle or, or Raquel also. So I, I get that. But if you are coming into an organization and your approach is team selling, but that's not the culture or the, the approach of the company that you're joining, 
how do you bring that in? It's going to feel very uncomfortable and very foreign to that new company that you're working with um, mm -hmm. to get everybody to understand the reasons behind it. But what are your thoughts there about creating that comfort level and, and helping them see the value in it as well? Yeah. So, so I sense the, the real question here is, is how do you embed this in your organization? And sure. even harder if you're coming in as, let's say, a sales performer mm -hmm. um, and other people don't do it, managers don't talk about it, they don't encourage it, your comp system is not, uh, doesn't reward it, people don't talk to each other, mm -hmm. uh, you've, got, you've got a big road ahead. So I think realistically, that person, if they're used to closing big sales and they need multiple people to close big sales and they're not getting any support, they're probably not gonna last long in that organization. But that's the cynical side of me. Let's talk about the more optimistic side. Um, I wanna own the responsibility. And so owning the responsibility means I've gotta break down those barriers. So I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna meet people who I think can help me and who I can help and develop relationships with them. I'm going to invest in those relationships before I need them. Um, so that's having a broad internal network of resources. Um, people can help you advance or close um, opportunities. Um, from a leadership standpoint, um, I work with leadership teams on what I call the three C's. Um, number one, communicate what your expectations are. Uh, number two, coach them to reward when it's happening and correct when it's not. And number three, compensate the behavior you're looking for. And so that's, that's the way you enable teamwork, effective teamwork in an organization from a leadership standpoint. Um, and it takes some time, um, and, but, but it's, it's worth investing in if we're looking for bigger opportunities that cross the silos of different areas. And, and, and to your point about there being you know, different size opportunities and obviously different size companies as well, do you, do you find that team selling is, is an approach that works regardless of the company size and regardless of the, the deal size, if you will, or is it really more for mid and, and large market companies? No, it's, it's, it's anywhere. I mean, Ken, you, you just use an example that's real life. You sure, know, sure. Bring a recruiter. Right. Um, I might bring a partner. Um, as the salesperson might bring a sales engineer or a technical resource, um, even somebody to do a demo. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you just have a sales manager um, or somebody senior in your organization coming into your market and wants to go out and have some customer meetings. Mm -hmm. so two of you are having a meeting. But if you go back to that build process, if you don't, if you're not mindful about what you're doing, there's only a small chance you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. The goal here is to try to put the odds on your side. So talk about roles, who's going to play the lead, talk about talk time, practice introductions, practice key messages, stay aligned during the meeting, do have a debrief afterwards, even if it's only two of you. So it's not just the domain of large organizations. Anytime we add people, it adds complexity. And the more people you add, the more complex it is. Right, true, very good. So a, a little bit of a, of a side question, just kind of, again, given the current situation where we are right now, where all of us are dealing with uh, the realities of virtual conversations, right? And it's, it's, again, it's tough to, to read cues. It's tough to have that rapport built as strongly when you're, you, know, you have a screen between you and your potential you know, customer as well. Uh, any thoughts around, uh, from what you're hearing from your clients right now, things that they're doing during this time over the next you know, month or so, month and a half, uh, to stay connected or to reconnect with clients also, whether it's a team-based approach or whether it's just, you know, one-on-one? -on -one. Well, I think the most important thing is you can get a virtual fireplace behind you. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. That makes it's it all fun. about the backdrop. Without the backdrop, yeah, you're doing the fail. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, it's, I think different people in different organizations are, they're in different stage of denial or acceptance, depending on how you look at it, about the current situation. Um, I'd say... You know, so what are we about three and a half weeks into lockdown? Um, the first two weeks, I sense that most people were just paralyzed. Most, not all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that goes on the client side and also on, on the selling side. But starting midweek last week and certainly into this week, I think people have mostly turned corner. Um, and it's, you know, it's a lot of change and a, lot's, a, a lot is different about the current environment. 
So I think part of what we're doing, and you know, I'm, I'm doing a webinar with one of my clients in, in just an hour or two, and you know, they, they've all got Zoom, um, but they're still a little stuck on what do we do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I'm going to give them some messages, and the messages are keep your activity high, um, just because um, it's harder to get to people and you don't have lunch and coffee mm -hmm. doesn't mean people still won't meet with you. Um, it's important to know that clients still have problems. They're still trying to make decisions. They might be different decisions than the ones you were talking about before this, but you've earned access and you got to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, keep up your activity with centers of influence and um, with your pipeline opportunities, get in, talk to them and have what I'm, what I'm calling a rediscovery meeting which don't just check in and see how they are. That's good, that's human, that's you caring about them, which is great, but things have changed for them. And in order for you to be an advisor to them, to help them, you gotta find out where they are mm -hmm. uh, and do more discovery. And you're gonna learn different things than what was the picture before this whole thing started. And the goal in that rediscovery meeting is to find some way to help them or advance the conversation in a different way that's a scary thought because it's going to reshape your pipeline, but that's how we get through this. Um, as far as the team selling principles, you know, they only apply in the fact that if I'm a salesperson, I got to figure out how those 6.8 have changed and maybe some of them are gone. Um, right. And how are they making decisions? Sure. And if I need Elaine on this call. Is she, does she have a skill? Is she engaged or is she still paralyzed? And we're going to have to spend some time in our prep to make sure that that pivotal moment where I need to bring her in, we're ready for that. Can uh, I, I like, answer yeah. that question for you? No, that's great. Yeah, actually, I, I like that term rediscovery meeting as well. I've, I've been really kind of reaching out to my, leg I call them legacy clients, and I've been calling them legacy calls as well. Uh, but I like the rediscovery. And I've, and I've been, you know, again, back to your point a little while ago about making sure there's th that your, your prospect or your client understands the value in the conversation and the value in the reconnecting, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'm telling clients, you know, that I'm talking to a lot of clients right now, taking everybody's temperature, getting a sense for what's happening out there, how they're doing and what they're seeing for the back half of the year. And then I'm sharing on each, each new call, I'm sharing the results of my previous calls as well, obviously without naming names as far as companies go. Mm -hmm. um, but that seems to create more of a dialogue versus, hey, how are you? Are you okay? To your point, um, nobody has time just to kind of say how they're doing. It's got to be some kind of a value proposition there as well. Agreed. Yeah. Another question from, uh, from Joe as well, talking about, you know, and, and I think to your point a minute ago about how some of the folks you may have talked to, let's say 45 days or even 30 days ago, um, at, as part of that team sale, maybe that those folks on the, on the uh, buying side got laid off, got restructured, got furloughed, who knows. Um, but if you have a team that you're selling to and somebody in that team is no longer there, or if you had a conversation and it didn't seem to go very well, do you reach out to the, your main point in contact? Do you reach out to the person that you feel maybe didn't kind of uh, click with you quite as well? How do you, how do you follow up after that conversation, after that meeting, if you will? Yeah, I mean, so, so the deck got totally reshuffled. And so yeah, it really has. And every, every week it's changing. Yeah. We can't, we can't find some of the cards. Um, so, so what do you do? Yeah. Well, we, we can't sell if we can't get access to people. So, I mean, that's job number one. So, and, and that, that's the argument for having more broader, deeper um, relationships mm -hmm. in an important client organization and not just relying on one person because that's just too risky. And so you have one person gone and maybe it's your best relationship. Well, if you go back to that org chart, that relationship mapping that we were doing for Neo just a little while ago, we have to go back to the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And now we're racing that circle. And now the dynamic has changed. It's not just that that circle is gone, um, but how they're going to make a decision has also changed. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the rediscovering. Try to figure that out. And when we've got access to somebody else, say, okay, I know you were working on this. I know this was important. I also know that uh, Jane played an important role in that. How are you all going to make this decision without Jane? Mm -hmm. You know. And so again, I'm just going back into the discovery because you know the the deck that we shuffled. Right, sure, sure, exactly. We have just a few minutes uh, left here. So if anybody ha has any last questions, I encourage you to go ahead and, and uh, let us know, certainly. Uh, but I want to kind of finish up, if we can, talking about kind of tone. 
right? And this is again, team, individual, whatever it might be. And, and even if you're on the, on the you know, buying side and people are reaching out to you, I think it's really important right now to, to not come across as being tone deaf, right? I mean, I've, I have received so many emails from people just selling services with no mention of what's happening out there, no sense of you know, the, 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 the world and how it's changed, right? It's just sell, sell, sell. And I know there's an awful lot of pressure on sales folks right now because their quotas are still their quotas. There's no change in them, at least not yet. Um, but they're losing a good two, sometimes three months of selling opportunity. So the pressure is on for them to really sell. But a question for you is with regard to how do you, how do you maintain that tone so that you are acknowledging the, the new world around us? Uh, and how do you still sell without coming across as being, you know, so uh, kind of impersonal, if you will, uh, that you're turning off the potential buyers? Yeah, Any I mean, thoughts there? Yeah, many. Uh, that's a timely question. Uh, one of the things um, when I'm evaluating a sales organization to start out with, um, one of the things that we try to test for is what I call good empathy versus bad empathy. And it's an interesting concept for people. Um, bad empathy is projecting your feelings mm -hmm. on somebody else. So an example would be in this, in the current days, current environment, um, boy, I'm stressed out. I'm worried about this pandemic. I'm worried about a recession. I'm worried about whether my company will make it. And I, because I'm worried, I assume that my clients are worried about that too. Right. So I don't call them because it's just a bad time. And I don't want to be that pushy salesperson. That's bad empathy because they're in a difficult space. That part is true. But what good empathy is, is the courage to call them up and the compassion and the empathy to care enough about them to ask about it. Um, and so acknowledgement and empathy and asking more questions and listening, that's good empathy. And that's what trusted advisors do. But you gotta show up to, to, to demonstrate good empathy and to be that advisor for them during a difficult period to help. They still have to make difficult decisions and if you're going to be successful, you're going to help them make those decisions. Um, but bad empathy is just making assumptions. You're never in the game. And most people get caught between those two. That's a really good point. Really good point. And one of the things I've been, I've kind of just learned about myself also is, you know, it, this, this, this is a test for me. Did I do a good enough job with my clients previously to really know about who they are, who their family is, what's happening, you know, who's, who's important in their personal lives also. So when I call them up for these legacy or rediscovery conversations, I can say, you know, how is Sally, you know, your wife doing? How are the kids? I know they're in elementary school. If you did a good job listening previously, right? And now you can use those listening skills to circle back around and be very empathetic to your point. And with that good empathy, it really goes a very, very long way. True. And I'd say if, if we have people who are on the, um, on the webinar this morning who are business owners or sales managers, you know, one of the biggest ways that you can help your team is by practicing this with them. You know, when you have a team meeting, a virtual meeting, give them a scenario and see what they do. And I'll tell you from workshops that I lead, empathy is one of those things that salespeople tend to be really crappy with. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's true. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we try but what comes across isn't what we intend. And so we need better technique to be able to demonstrate that empathy to reduce tension and build relationships even in difficult times. So I would say if you're a sales manager on the phone, find opportunities to practice this. And if you need ideas, reach out to me and I'm happy to give you some of them. Yeah, great, perfect, perfect, very good. All right, good. Well, I think we're going to wrap things up now. If any other questions come up in the last minute or so, let us know. Um, just as a quick reminder again, uh, please, if you'd like to be involved in any of the, the success quads, uh, where you get together via Zoom or you know, whatever platform you want, and just do a bit of a deeper dive into everybody's background and how you can help each other. Uh, and you can, it's also a very uh, safe way to practice your good empathy. Um, so please let us know. Go ahead and send an email to Elaine directly and she will put those together um, and you'll get that email by tomorrow also. Uh, okay, good. So a couple last questions here we can end up with, which are, which are really good. Um, when, it, when, it's, when it, let's see, oh, okay. When it, when it comes to um, organizations that are kind of using a uh, electronic system, this is from uh, Garrett. So uh, how do you, how do you, the question is, how do you get to the table with your team 
when a company is using an electronic system to weed out suppliers. So it could be an RFP, it could be something very, very impersonal. So you're, you're trying to get to that stage where you have a team selling opportunity, but you're not sure how to get there. Any, any thoughts there if the, if the procurement group, for example, is the one making the initial decision about who to invite in for that team meeting, how do you break through that? Garrett, it's interesting that you're asking the question since you do those searches and you try yes. to talk to people like us yeah. <laughs> having access to the decision makers. Uh, you know, so when it comes to a formal RFP, a formal search, the hardest time to get access to and build relationships with decision makers mm -hmm. is in the search process. Because when you have a consultant like Garrett, who's trying to get a pure apples to apples comparison, and just going on the technical features and the cost and trying to balance all those things, he's the gatekeeper. And they're trying to do that for very important reasons. Um, go back to something that we talked about a little bit earlier. We're now coming into the sales conversation later. Mm -hmm. so Garrett calls you and invites you to participate in the search. That company is already pretty far down the line in terms of making a decision on, for example, an ERP system. Mm -hmm. The goal for a real salesperson is to create an opportunity that wouldn't have happened without her. And so what does that mean? We get involved and we have access in the thinking process before there's a search going on. We wanna hear what are the challenges that they're having and give them some ideas. And at some point they're gonna bring in Garrett's group to do the search, but we wanna get access early find those challenges out and help them form their thinking before they even hire a consultant to at least give our input, our print on it. And that's the way we not only um, uh, reshape the search, but also build relationships and have a fuller understanding than the other vendors who get brought in by Garrett later in the sales process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Garrett, you probably didn't like that answer, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. No, it's great. It's, 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 it's tough. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to turn an, an initial in-personal uh, interaction, if you will, when it is an RFP or something like that, uh, into something that is more personal. It's, not, it's much easier said than done. It takes a, a lot of practice and a little bit of luck also to a certain extent. Yeah. Okay, last question here, then we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, any thoughts on how you turn, let's see, how do you, from Mike Silverman, how do you turn a nice to have into a must have? I'm assuming that that's, you know, in terms of, uh, the quality of what you're offering to your, your client, to your prospect, right? Uh, they might think something is kind of a, 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 a bonus, but you know that if you can offer that as one of your key differentiators as the seller, uh, is there a way to migrate that conversation so they understand the importance of the skills or, or of the, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, kind of the qualities, if you will, that you provide? So Mike, to your question, the way, the way I'd answer it is, if, if you know that it's a must have, because you have access to one of the or more of the 6.8 decision makers who believe it's a must have, but one other person that you're communicating in that chain um, doesn't see it as a must have, you're gonna use your persuasion skills to talk about what the benefit is and maybe they're just not seeing it. Now, I wanna answer in a slightly different way. Um, a lot of times we can't create urgency where it doesn't exist for the client. So a common mistake that sales professionals make as we pursue opportunities that look like they're interesting for people to hear about, um, but they're not what I would call qualified. A qualified opportunity is one, well, it's a little bit more complicated, but let me just distinguish, Mike, between a need, a nice to have, and one that's, there's an urgent and compelling need. So we ought to be able to answer at least these two questions. Why does the client need to do this? And why do they need to do it now? Versus ignoring it, or just pushing, pushing it down the road. Um, and if you're not sure about that, we need to get access to more of the 6.8 decision makers, or we need to go deeper with the ones we have access to. Um, because most salespeople, and I've got data to support this, um, don't go deep enough in their questioning to find out whether the need is urgent and compelling. And so they end up pursuing opportunities and proposing on opportunities that never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So Mike, I hope that's answering your question. Good point, yeah. No, thank you, that's great, that's great, fantastic. 
All right, good, good. And several of you have mentioned also, uh, thank you for your feedback, by the way, we are trying to figure out the best way to do this. Several have mentioned that there's a way to adjust the uh, settings so that you can see everybody. Uh, so we're gonna talk offline after this one and see what, the, what we can do about that for next time. But please, as you get the email follow-up uh, today and tomorrow, if, if there are other suggestions, or other things that you think we can do from our end as, as hosts, uh, to make this even more engaging of a conversation, please you know, feel free to share that. We would love to hear your feedback and your input as well. We are learning just as you are as we go through this. So um, you know, please, uh, we appreciate you bearing with us and, and being part of this as well. Uh, and then lastly, a couple of folks have asked about getting a copy of your book, even an autographed copy of your book. Also, Michael, I, I saw that you put uh, your email address in the uh, chat there. So if anybody wants to reach out to Michael directly, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, I know that he also is on LinkedIn and very active there, so we can take care of that. Uh, but we can chat about that offhand, offline uh, also, Michael, about uh, maybe making some autographed copies available uh, to our attendees as well. Happy to. Uh, it's, yeah. it's been fun having our little fireside chat um, and I've really appreciated the questions uh, that your members have, have posed today. So thank you everybody for that uh, and appreciate your spending some of your time with, uh, with us today. Definitely, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe out there. Stay dry in the crazy rain. And uh, we'll be back to you. Like I said, we'll, we'll confirm our next uh, event coming up. We have one on the 30th of April, and we'll confirm the one with our colleague over in China as well. So thank you very much. Uh, stay healthy and be safe out there. Take care.